Let's understand the world a little better. I'm your host, Timon Wunderlich, and with me is Dr. John Abramson, um, who's been on the faculty of Harvard Medical School for 25 years and who is the author of the book, Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare and How We Can Repair It. Hello. Hi, Timon. Thanks for having me. Um, I would like to talk to you about um, today, obviously, Big Pharma. Um, I think it is in... Uh, in the talks of um, many people who are who are um, um, who are thinking a lot about it in terms of uh, conspiracy theories, and um, now you, for one, are someone who actually um, looked at the data and who um, actually wrote a whole book about it, um, Big Farmer, and um, maybe some misalliances uh, when it comes to um, profit generation from pharmaceuticals. Correct. Could you maybe elaborate on the misalliances especially? Well, uh, what has happened and particularly happened in the United States is that the pharmaceutical industry has largely taken over the research that produces the knowledge, and I put air quotes around knowledge, that comes to doctors, that informs doctors about the best way to practice medicine and help their patients. And what's happened, especially in the United States, and we can talk about why we're different, but what's happened is that the pharmaceutical industry has intruded itself into the process of the creation of the research agenda, the research itself, the analysis of the research, the publication of the research in the medical journals, and then the broadcast of the research through PR and, and advertising. And what we've got is an industry whose primary function is to maximize profits and return those profits to their shareholders. That's their, that's their primary responsibility is to maximize their profits. And what we've got is we're allowing that industry to achieve its goals without adequate oversight. And at the same time, we teach our doctors that they must uh, receive their new information from certain sources like peer-reviewed medical journals and uh, clinical practice guidelines. So what we're doing is imposing this commercially tainted knowledge, and the doctors have no idea how commercially tainted it is, on doctors And the, the, standards for commu the, the, the standards of care in the community are dictated largely by the drug companies. And we've got good doctors trying their best to help their patients and actually being unwitting agents of the drug companies. Now, in the United States, this is particularly grave because we have the fewest guardrails on this system. And we are paying dearly for the lack of control over the, or independent oversight of the so-called knowledge that doctors receive. So in the United States, we are having 1.1 million deaths a year in excess of the death rates in the other developed countries. That's 3,000 deaths a day. That's like a 9-11 every day in excess deaths in the United States. And for that, we are paying $2.3 trillion dollars excess for our health care above the, price, the, the money that is spent annually in the other wealthy countries. We're spending more than twice as much as the uh, other wealthy countries. Um, so we've got this, yeah, we've got this disaster, historical disaster. I mean, the rate of death is so much higher than it is right now in the, um, in the is Israel Hamas conflict. Uh, and yet this goes on every single day and it goes on largely under the radar and Americans are told and believe for the most part that they're getting the best health care in the world when in fact we have by far the worst health care, health and health care amongst the wealthy nations. How is the U.S. there different uh, than other countries? Why do they have these problems? Um, we're different in a number of ways. Uh, number one is uh, that our research agenda 
has been largely taken over by the drug and device companies. So that 96% of research money in the United States is uh, uh, 96% of the research in the United States is about drugs and devices. And only about 4% is how to make the population more healthy. So the, Mm. the, the air quotes knowledge that doctors receive from their medical journals, 96% of it is about drugs and devices. But the truth is that only 20% of our health is determined by medical care. And because the doctor, the information that's coming to doctors is almost entirely about drugs and devices, that's how doctors are taught to practice for individuals and for communities instead of addressing the other 80% of, of the factors that determine health, like our physical environment and our diet and nutrition and um, education and social services. And why is that? Because it's harder to profit off these factors? Exactly. That's exactly right. Ah. So, so in the U.S. Uh, or in the other wealthy OECD countries, the ratio of social spending to medical spending is about 1.8. There's 1.8 times more money is spent on social services than on medical services. In the United States, that ratio is reversed. So our spending is only on social services, uh, on medical, excuse me, our spending on social services is only 0.8 times as much as the um, spending on health on healthcare. So what's happening is that we are misallocating our resources in the United States to to medicalization as opposed to the 80% of health that's determined by non-medical factors. And that's how we're an outlier. Now you say, well, why do the doctors put up with that? And that's because the journals that they read and the guidelines that they're taught they must follow tell them that they've got to practice like that, that they've got to practice in accord with the new knowledge that is produced and published in the journals and the guidelines. What the doctors don't know, and this is true in Europe as well, but it, it has a much more detrimental effect in the United States, is that the, when the journals public, publish articles, the most prestigious journals, New England Journal, JAMA, Lancet, the most prestigious journals in the world, publish peer-reviewed articles that are then taken as evidence-based medicine and put into practice by well-intentioned doctors. The doctors don't know that the peer reviewers have not had access to the actual data from the clinical trials. So the what do you mean co- they don't have access? The, the, when, a, when a manuscript, a clinical trial is performed, and then um, uh, I have a diagram on this in my book, it's an, it's an iceberg. And the top of the iceberg that you can see from above the water is the peer-reviewed articles in the medical journals and the clinic pra- clinical practice guidelines and the drug company marketing and advertising and so forth. But what's underneath the water that can't be seen and can only be seen, uh, it can usually only be seen in litigation when the drug company is sued and has to produce all of their data. Um, that data, th- uh, thousands, millions of pages of data, which gets condensed into about two or 3,000 pages in a clinical study report, which is a summary. And then that data is used to write the article that's published in the medical journal, usually supervised by the drug companies or uh, under the influence of the drug companies. That data is used to shrink it down to a manuscript that can be published in a medical journal, a 10-page article or so. But it's only that 10-page article that's submitted to the medical journal as the evidence in the article, as the evidence from the clinical study. <laughs> it's wow. only that 10 pages when there's thousands, if not millions of pages of data that identify not just uh, what the rules of the study were, the, the uh, protocol and the statistical analysis plan, but also the, uh, the actual analyses that you need to check to make sure that the manuscript that's submitted is an accurate and complete representation of the results of the clinical trials. But that's 
the, the, the peer reviewers and the medical journal editors and the writers of the clinical practice guidelines don't have access to that data. And they're taking the submitted manuscript as the God's honest truth. And that just doesn't work because the drug company's job is to maximize its profits. Yes. And they're going to push it as far as they can to sell as much expensive product as they can. And in the United States, we've got the most open uh, path for the drug companies to do that. In Germany, you have a wonderful organization, which is a health technology assessment organization. Um, IQWIG, I think, are the uh, initials of that organization in Germany. And they look at, uh, they, they can't see all the data, but they look at a broader slice of the data and they come up with much more critical assessment of new drugs and they inform German doctors and that informs coverage. But we have no such organization in the United States. There's no oversight of this commercially dominated process. Uh, I'm assuming these problems persist for a long time. So wh why is there yet a solution or yet someone to change this? Yeah, well, let's let's separate that into two questions. Um, these, these problems have existed for a long time, but it's kind of a dialectical process that rolls along and the drug companies get much better at creating information that supports the use of their products. And then another factor that's really important in the United States that differentiates us from other countries is we have no price controls in the United States. So in the United States, the average annual cost, excuse me, the median annual cost of a new drug in 2008 in the United States was $2,115, $2,115. In 2022, the median annual cost of a new drug was over $250,000, $250,000. And now we don't have a mechanism to inform doctors which of those new drugs are truly superior. There's only a small percentage of those new drugs that are truly superior to older therapies, but the doctors don't have access to a critical assessment of that, of that information. So how does this usually work? You, you've been a doctor for many years. I don't, I don't know if you still are, but um, it, when a new drug comes out, uh, a doctor finds out about it about, uh, through journals, through uh, medical journals. Yes. And um, that, that's a way of getting the information. Or is there any other uh, source that they uh, then counsel? Or Well, let's back up just a little bit. A new drug can't come out unless it's approved by the FDA by the Food and Drug Administration. What the Food and Drug Administration requires is often just one clinical trial that the drug company chooses to submit. And often that clinical trial is set up so that the new drug is compared to nothing, a placebo, or a drug that's not the best drug therapy or a dose that's not the best dose. So it's not a fair comparison, and the FDA will accept that to approve the drug. Now, you could make the argument, it's possible that you could make the argument that the FDA should allow new drugs that are not superior on the market. Maybe they should tell doctors they're not superior. They don't. But <clears throat> excuse me, having a, a broad range of drugs can sometimes be useful. Sometimes a patient does a little better on one drug or another. But The, the FDA is approving drugs because they're statistically significantly better than nothing, but not, they don't require it to be statistically significantly better than the best available therapy that's already on the market. So the okay. FDA approves the drug based on it being statistically significantly better than nothing, but sometimes that measure of statistical significance is statistically significant, but the difference isn't clinically significant. But okay. the FDA doesn't care about that. They'll still approve the drug. So the drug approves the the, the, the FDA approves the drug and it's like a horse race a horse race when the gates get opened and the horses 
charge out of the gates. So when the FDA approves the drug, it's like the bell rings and the horses all go galloping forward. Then in the United States, we don't have price controls and we don't have health technology assessment. Our peer reviewers can't see the data. Yours can't either. But because there's no price controls and no health technology assessment, the doctors don't have an alternative, an alternate source of information about which drugs are truly useful or not. So, mm. and, and the fact that we have no price controls means that there's enormous amounts of money for marketing, for TV ads, for uh, drug uh, salesmen to call on doctors and so forth. So there's this um, Wild West kind of marketing effort that goes on in the United States. And there's not easy access for the doctors to get the real data. I, I participated in uh, litigation for about 15 years. Um, in that litigation, I was, uh, uh, worked for plaintiff's attorneys. So the uh, attorneys or the plaintiffs were suing the drug companies for economic harm or personal injury to recover the money back. And in that, my role as an expert, I got to see all the data literally all the data, the hard drives from the, the, the drug companies I had access to. And there's so much money involved in these suits that the lawyers can hire rooms full of geeks who set up data um, spreadsheets and uh, databases so that I could query that data and test any assumption about what the drug companies might have done and how they might have made comparisons that misrepresented the benefits, exaggerated the benefits, or uh, minimized the harms of those drugs. I get to see that, but that's like five or 10 years after the drugs have been approved. And even when we find outrageous, outrageous material, like I testified in a federal uh, case uh, that I can talk about because it, it went to court, in, in open court, and I can talk about it. but. Uh, Pfizer was sued for misrepresenting um, the safety and efficacy of gabapentin. We call it Neurontin. The brand name is Neurontin in the United States. Mm -hmm. And they claimed that it worked, uh, was effective for pain and for diabetic neuropathy. Um, and in this trial, we showed how they misrepresented the data, how they did a study and failed to analyzed the study and gave twice the FDA recommended dose and um, a, allegedly got the dose so high that they created side effects and the side effects caused people to know whether they were in the Neurontin group or the control group. And that led people to say that they were getting uh, better from the drug. The jury in this trial found that Pfizer was guilty not only of fraud, but of racketeering like gangsters, ruled that they were guilty of racketeering violations. That never, uh, barely got in the newspapers. It was barely covered by the press. And Neurontin is still, this is 20 years later, Neurontin is still one of the best-selling drugs in the United States, even though it's available as a generic. The doctors were so um, lied to in ways that they were taught to accept new information. I don't know if this is true. Someone told me that when horses are sent out to stud, some uh, female horses <laughs> will wear high heels. Video went off. I'm sorry. No, uh, no problem. Uh, where was I? Um, uh, the doctors are so lied to, you said. Yeah, they're um, so lied to, so skillfully lied to, so that it's like, just threading a needle where the information is delivered to them in the ways that they're taught to receive it in medical school. So that once they're lied to and they believe it and they start to prescribe the drug for their patients, that information is almost impossible to change. So what came out this trial was in 2008, we showed that it was a fraud. It was a fraud mm -hmm. and they used gangster tactics to perpetrate the fraud. And yet Neurontin is still one of the most widely prescribed drugs in the United States. Wow. And that is 
Um, how big was this uh, court case? Where um, I think you you said you uh, represented or you were on the side of um, of patients or um, some other organization. Yeah, in this case, in this case, I was on the side. Um, it wasn't an allegation. There was not an allegation that Neurontin hurt patients. The allegation was that the insurance companies and the unions that paid for the Neurontin were ripped off, that they were sold a product that wasn't, didn't do what the manufacturer said it would do. So I, in the particular case that I was in, um, one of the largest healthcare providing organizations, Kaiser Permanente, sued Pfizer for the money that it spent based on the lies that it told the doctors. Yes, because that, that's what I was just, uh, I just wanted to go on to about that. Um, isn't there an op opponent, let's say, of the big pharma or someone who is uh, whose interest is in not having um, bad uh, studies out there, uh, and that is the insurance, the healthcare insurance industry? So isn't there yeah. interest? to to um uh, to have good studies out or have these peer reviewed in a in a better way and they also are a big um big player in the field Timon, that's a, it's a really important question and the way that the insurers work in the united states whether they're for profit or not for profit is that their primary interest is in maintaining their patient base The value of the insurance organization is the size of the patient base. And when an insurance company, um, can you hear me? Did I lose you? I can hear you. My um, software just stopped. Um, if you, you, can, you can keep on talking. I can, you can um, keep going, yeah. Yeah, so you the, can keep going. The, the job of the insurance company, you would think, <clears throat> would be to demand good data and to get that data out to the doctors who are prescribing patients who are insured by that company. That's what you would think intuitively the insurance company's job is. But that's not really its job. Its job is really to keep its, the, the patients that it insures happy enough to stay enrolled in that plan. They want to keep their, their subscriber base intact. And an ins so an insurance company can't go against the grain when something is known to be, uh, if I could explain to the company that this is wrong and they shouldn't waste their money on it, but they're going to anger their patients uh, and prescribing doctors by not including this, even though the facts show they're wrong. But if they're going to anger their subscriber base, they won't, they're not interested in it. Because so the patient they're not the safe the drug. Patient. Yeah. yeah. So the, this, the, the, you would think that the insurers would be overseeing this, but they don't. And in the United States, we don't have anyone else that's overseeing this. In Germany, in France, in UK, there are organizations that oversee the, in, the integrity of the knowledge that is getting out to doctors, but we don't have that. Wow. And in Germany, it's also a little bit different as that um, prescription drugs aren't allowed to be advertised in the same way as in the U.S., um, so there might not be this, um, this call from the patients that they want a certain drug, um, from their right. insurance, I, I would assume. Right. So you, you and the other European countries don't have the push that we have in the United States, which is to market these drugs and, um, you know, to promote them just like their beer or cigarettes or bubble gum. Um, But we also don't have the pull in terms of having some organization that's publicly trusted that will weigh in, do what you, you were hoping the insurance companies would do, but a yep. disinterested organization that will weigh in to tell the insurers and to tell the doctors which drugs have true value and which ones don't. So in the United States, we've got the biased articles. The research agenda is largely commercially controlled. And then the data, how the, how the studies are set up and the data are kept private uh, as company property. And they just send a 10-page manuscript to the journal. So there's no control on that. And then we have no external organization. And meanwhile, our prices aren't controlled. So the 
average prescription drug is three and a half times more costly in the United States than in the European countries. And now our prices are going uh, uh, you know, through the roof. It's, through, it's not through the roof, it's through the stratosphere at $250,000 a year uh, median price for new drugs. So the, the, it's all the guardrails are off in the United States. And to go back to those statistics that I uh, mentioned at the beginning, we have 1.1 million excess deaths in the United States a year, partly because our health care, the pills and the treatments aren't overseen, largely because we spend all our money on the 20% of health that has to do with health care. And we largely ignore, especially in comparison to the European countries, the social determinants of health, which would really make our population healthier. Um, I still want to go over one more time uh, to the doctors, how they get their information, how actually one doctor, um, when he has a patient, decides that he should prescribe this specific drug. Because I, I actually, my one of my best friends, or my best friend, um, he's a medical school um, currently, and uh, e even in school or um, already in school, they um, uh, in in the lectures uh, they get recommendations for certain drugs for certain problems. Um, And uh, I, I always wondered there um, if if there is not al uh, also a problem with that, uh, like uh, or recommend uh, recommending a specific drug and not just um, the uh, I don't I don't know the solution I guess the the chemicals or the understanding behind it, but a, a specific drug from a specific uh, from a specific, uh, specific uh, company or brand. Right. So there are two levels of problems there. Um, one is that they're getting told to prescribe specific drugs. <clears throat> And I know it happens, <clears throat> I'm not sure in Germany, but there are examples that I've heard of in Europe where the drug companies are actually funding the residency programs. And obviously they're going to try to convince the residents that they're funding to use their drugs. So there's that misinformation and the lack of transparency and peer review happens in Europe as well as the United States. It's just worth more money in the United States because the drug companies have more marketing power. So that's one level of problem. And that's very serious. The idea is the expression uh, evidence-based medicine used in Germany. Have you um, heard that expression? Yes. Yes, I think I have. Yes. So it's, <clears throat> it's widely used in the United States. And it means to base your clinical decisions like your friend is being taught to base your clinical decisions on the articles that are in peer-reviewed uh, journals that describe clinical trials and on the clinical practice guidelines. <clears throat> But that evidence is not transparent. So that mm. the, the, the journal editors, peer reviewers don't get the real data. The people who write the guidelines don't get the real data. And I know that that's true, at least in part, in Europe as well. I, uh, Or uh, I know in the UK, in their cholesterol guidelines, they people who wrote those, the experts who wrote those guidelines did not have access to the real data. So that's one problem, is people are taught specifically to use drugs that have not been shown to be superior to older, less expensive drugs. That's problem number one. And their professors are getting paid by the drug companies probably more so in the United States than Germany, but I'm sure it goes on in Germany as well. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one problem, is getting taught to use specific drugs that are newer and more expensive, but not more effective. <clears throat> There's a, at least as serious a problem that's a sociological issue, that in medical school, not only are students taught about the anatomy and physiology and which drugs are recommended by the people who are teaching them, but they're taught about how to receive information as their careers go on. They're taught about what sources of information are legitimate and should be trusted. The word for that, in, uh, Thomas Kuhn was a philosopher of science in the United States, and he coined the phrase paradigm. And a paradigm, <clears throat> um, it doesn't mean that you have a, a better car that um, whatever goes faster. That's not a paradigm change. A paradigm change is when the 
sources of information are found to be lacking and there's a scientific revolution that remedies the problem. So when mm -hmm. Galileo was figuring out that the earth is not the center of the universe and that uh, he thought that, that the earth um, rotates around the sun, when he published that, the church put him under a house arrest. They could have executed him. They made him recant his theory and his book. But that paradigm change came because Galileo had access to a telescope. And that was a new technology that the previous ideology that the earth was the center of the universe, um, the telescope allowed the scientists to see that that previous paradigm was not accurate that it was false and that it needed to be revised, that the sun was essentially the center of the universe. Obviously it's not, but it's the center of our little part of the universe. Um, what's happened now is the paradigm that your friend and people, students in the United States as well are taught is that these articles that are published in the respectable journals are produce the evidence that they should rely on at face value to um, keep their practice up to date. And the clinical practice guidelines that put together all of the clinical trials, none of which have been peer reviewed and the experts don't have access to the actual data, but that, that the clinical trials produce even a higher level of evidence because they include all the studies. Mm. That's a, the paradigm. And your friend is being taught that. And the problem is that the commercial interests have become geniusly skilled at manipulating that, at controlling the upstream sources of that information so that when it gets published in a respectable journal as the bottom line in the abstract, the conclusion in the abstract, that is, they're taught to take that as the gospel truth when in fact the drug companies have captured that process. and. The reason why the information is created about that subject and how it's created and how it's analyzed is now largely controlled by the drug companies, not by independent scientists. Wow. And do you, any, do you see anything that we can do against it that we can sort of solve this problem? <clears throat> the first thing and the most important thing I think we can do against it is to have podcasters like yourself and journalists who have courage to name the problem, to get the problem out, that doctors are well-meaning, good faith, hardworking doctors are being manipulated because their sources of knowledge have been taken over by the drug industry. The doctors don't understand this. If you ask a doctor, um, do you think the drug companies have too much influence? They would say yes. If you ask that doctor, does that he or she think that their patient care is manipulated by the drug companies, the doctors will say, no, no, no. I know enough to sort through the misrepresentations and to provide my patients with the best possible care. And what they don't know is there's no way they can possibly sort through the information. It's locked inside corporate computers. You can't get it without a subpoena. And that without having spent the time that I spent in litigation, that you the doctors can't possibly understand how much they're being played with. But if then the doctors understand that there is a problem and uh, that that the way they're doing it currently is not um, not the best. Um, how would they then do it differently? I mean, is, is there an alternative to these journals, to these magazines? Sure there is. Sure there is. There, 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 if enough doctors and patients and nurses and healthcare workers and insurance companies and purchases of healthcare got together and said, our system has gone off the rails. We need transparency of data. Uh, we need independent organizations to guide physicians and payers on the best therapies. If we got together, we could basically strike. The, the journals um, aren't insisting on access to the full data. 
Well, you might say, well, why aren't they? They're, for the most part, nonprofit. The Lancet is owned by a for-profit company, but JAMA and the New England Journal are not. Why aren't they insisting on access to the data? Why do they go along with this system? And the answer is that they're making money from it. Mm. And why are the patient organizations going along with it? They're making money from it. And why are the nonprofit organizations like the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, I'm sure you have similar nonprofit organizations in Germany, they're making money on it. They're getting funded by the drug companies. So what's happening is there are all these relationships and the academic medical centers are making a lot of money on this. So all these relationships, these two party relationships between the drug companies and the academic medical centers, the medical journals, the insurers, um, they're all produce profits for both sides of that equation while the public is getting cheated. They're getting cheated economically and they're getting uh, cheated on their health. But this market failure that's going on where the organizations and the medical centers can make these relationships with the drug companies that are profitable for them, they're going to go ahead and do it until they're stopped. And there's an illusion that we ought to let markets, uh, we ought to have free markets and not interfere with the markets. But when there's a market failure like this, when the drug companies are making money and the academic medical centers and the journals and the nonprofit organizations are making money, they're not going to stop it on their own. You need some kind of external organization to come in and say, hey, you guys, you're having a party. You're making a ton of money. Everyone's getting rich here, except for the citizens and they're not getting healthy either. You need something, and I don't know what better organization than government to come in and say, wait a minute, that's market failure. If the journals know that they don't have transparent access to the clinical trial data, and yet the doctors and the public trust them to be presenting accurate clinical trial data, the government has to step in and uh, insist upon transparency so that there can be independent analysis of the results of the clinical trials. Now, that won't happen, especially in the United States, because we have so much money in politics. The drug companies just flood money. Two thirds of our of our politicians take money from the drug companies, both parties equally. Uh, it won't happen by itself. So you need government to come in. The problem is that government's taking money from the drug companies, too. So there needs to be an external coalition of healthcare professionals, the public, and the insurers that say this system doesn't work and we're going on strike. We won't tolerate this anymore. Now, we are so far from being able to get enough people who understand this well enough to say, we've had it, time out. We've had it. We're going on strike here. And I don't mean they shouldn't provide health care, but I mean they should cancel their journal subscriptions. Say, hey, if you guys don't have the male anatomy to do the right thing when you know it's the right thing. If you guys, we're not going to subscribe to your journal. Your journal is going to have a zero impact factor. And then it will become in the journal's interest to demand transparency. Mm. The journals won't demand transparency until they have to. The, the problem I would see that though is um, if, if the doctors don't have an alternative to these, to these journals, so if they're just saying now we won't, use these anymore um but they don't have something else that they could use as in, uh, to to get information they couldn't i mean could they really practice their job anymore so it would be a strike that is probably hard to um uh, to keep on going right well you're you're absolutely right but number one you're assuming that they that they they and their patients are benefiting from this false information about new drugs and they're not but more importantly There are some sources. The German Health Technology Assessment Group uh, publishes really good information. Let's elevate that to the highest standard. So it's not mm -hmm. clinical practice guidelines that are based on um, non-transparent trials, so that it's an independent organization. The German organization, the French uh, Health Organization, the German Uh, the uh, UK National Institute of Clinical Excellence, none of them are perfect, but they're better. So mm. that if we stop taking any information from the journals and rely totally on those independent organizations, 
that aren't getting paid off by the drug industry, we would be moving rapidly in the right direction. There would be less information, but it would be better information. And the journals could figure out a model. Let me, do I, can I tell a little story? Of course. Okay. So <clears throat> I was at a conference <clears throat> and I was sitting near an editor, not the editor in chief, but an editor of one of the world's most prestigious journals. And the meeting was over and we were walking out and I said to him or her, why don't you guys require that the drug companies submit what's called a clinical study report? It's usually two, two or 3,000 pages of data that the drug companies compile on any clinical trial that may have regulatory implications. So those exist. They already exist. It wouldn't cost money to make them. I said, why don't you guys just insist that when a 10-page manuscript is submitted that summarizes the results of a clinical trial, that the manufacturer has to also submit at the same time the two or 3,000-page clinical study report so that most of the information will be available to peer reviewers. Yep. And he said, before I took the next step, he said, because that would be a death spiral for the journal because it would hurt the journal, because the drug companies wouldn't submit their big clinical trials to the most prestigious journals, and because a large part of journals' income, 41% uh, of the Lancet's income in 2005, came from the, um, the drug companies buying reprints of these articles for their drug salesmen to hand out to the doctors. And if they insisted on the, <clears throat> if the journal insisted on transparency, then they would lose their income from reprints. So the journals know very quickly that this editor did not have to think about this. It was literally before I took the next step that he or she said there would be a death spiral for the journals. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing, but it's their business model. We all want to think. You know, we want to think the best of people and organizations. We don't want to think that the most trusted medical journals in the world would prevent transparency because it's in their financial interest. But that's what's going on. And that's so evil that doctors really can't believe it. But that's what's going on. <clears throat> wow. That reminds me of the, um, of the credit uh, rating agencies in the uh, financial crisis in a way. Um, I, I don't know if you saw the movie The Big Short, but uh, where they said they, they went to Fitch or Moody's and um, <laughs> asked them, why do you give out these false uh, credit ratings? And um, she answered, the woman at the counter answered, um, yeah, because if we get uh, give them bad ratings, they just go over to our competitors. Right. That's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same situation. And that's market failure. <clears throat> and that requires government intervention. But our government is bought off by the pharmaceutical industry. That's why we need this coalition. Nothing's going to happen until there's a coalition of healthcare professionals, the public, and insurers and businesses that pay for healthcare. Until that coalition is stronger than the money that the drug industry gives, uh, the, excuse me, yeah, that the drug industry gives to the politicians. Nothing can happen until that equation is tipped. And that we're so far from getting there. I mean, my book, Sickening, got almost no press coverage. I got good coverage on podcasts, uh, big podcasts, but almost no coverage from legacy media. It, the discussion is completely controlled uh, by the commercial interests. And there's got to be, the only way out of this mess is to have um, a groundswell of, of, of people who understand this and are willing to um, walk, walk the walk, you know, uh, walk the talk, whatever the expression is. The people who are willing to be courageous activists and talk to their friends in the coffee room and doctors talk to their colleagues in the doctor's lounge and nurses talk to each other wherever nurses go when they take a break. And until that conversation can take place and say, we are getting just ripped off by the drug companies and all of their financial partners, and we won't take it anymore. 
This won't change. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse faster and faster. Uh, and with that, I want to ask you, before we go on to our second segment, some rapid fire questions, I want to ask you, um, is there anything I should have asked you that I, that I didn't or anything else that you want to add? I, I just want to add that um, besides climate change, this is the biggest threat to the um, first world is that science is not being used in the service of humanity. It's being used in the service of investors. And this goes back behind the 1600s, the mid 1600s, when the Enlightenment scientists made the uh, formed the Royal Society of London and adopted the motto, um, nullius in verba, which means take nothing for granted. Take nothing for granted. But we're taught, and your friend in medical school is taught to take the, the sources of information that they're receiving for granted. And we can't do that anymore. So I hope that a billion people watch your podcast and get and get this message so that we can start to make some progress. I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. Um, over to the rapid fire questions. Um, note some of these are uh, not necessarily linked to your studies, but uh, more personal. And uh, please answer in round about two to three sentences so that they are really rapid fire. Well, that's tough. <laughs> um, are you ready? Yes. If you had a big billboard, let's say on Times Square, everybody would see it. What would you put on it? Um, if, about healthcare? Not I necessarily. Say... What do you want? <laughs> Anything. Anything. Uh, the first thing I would put on is peace is the way. And then the second thing I would put on is that if science is going to benefit humanity, it must be open uh, and independently analyzed. Do you have a favorite quote? I think it's Nullius in Verba. Take nobody's word for it. That science, science means open data. That's the fundamental definition of science. It was accepted in 1660. And now we've gone back essentially to the authority like the church exerted pre-enlightenment. We now have capital and investment exerting that authority now. And we need another reformation so that we get back to science being open and transparent and serving the public interest. What are the best sources uh, to inform oneself about uh, new, newly came, uh, coming out uh, drugs? What so that trust? would be the, yeah, the health technology assessment organizations, the German Health Technology Assessment, which I think is IQWIG, um, the French uh, um, um, health authorities, in England, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence Canada has a health technology assessment arm. I would go there to those nonprofit sources, government-related sources for information. But I would also say that they too do not have absolute access to the data. So I would go to those sources because they're the best, but with the understanding that they need to get better. Uh, Oh, uh, what would you have liked to known when you were 20? Uh, what I would have liked to have known is that it's not easy to make social change. It's easy to see at age 20. It's easy to see the need for social change. But it's not easy to see when you're feeling invincible and um, idealistic. It's not easy to see that the system is as it is because it's serving the most powerful interests in society. And that change will only come when the power of those uh, selfish interests is curtailed so that they can only make money by serving society. 
What is your newest, biggest insight? It keeps, uh, it keeps being my newest and biggest insight, and it keeps rolling and rolling and rolling, is that these forces won't stop until they're stopped. They're not going to stop on their own. They're not going to stop by a newspaper story here and there, that uh, cursory, a cursory story that just gets at the surface of this and lets people believe that they understand how, um, how serious the manipulation of scientific data is. Um, that, that, the, that this process is going to get worse and worse because it continues to generate enormous amounts of money. And until the people demand that science be first and foremost in the service of in public interest, not private interest, it's not going to stop. The people have to take control of this. It's like a global democracy. The United States, I think, is the worst example, but all countries, all the developed countries are tainted by it. And it's not going to stop until people demand that it stop. And that, that's a huge ask. These are complicated issues. I mean, we've been talking for uh, an hour now, and um, uh, the, um, we're just scratching the surface. And I, I want to put in an sh uh, absolutely shameless plug for my book. You cannot understand this. I, what's in that book took me 15 years of access to pharmaceutical company hard drives to put together exactly how serious this problem is. And I just hope that people will read it. Um, if people can't afford it, you can send me their email and I'll send them a PDF manuscript. But uh, I'll, this book must be read. If, if I can't get this book read, or other, there are other books, I think, that, are, that approach the same issue, If these books aren't read, there's no way to have a solution. I mean, it's a lifetime of work for me to get this down in a coherent way so people non-medical and medical people can understand it. And if we write these books and they're not read, it's just completely hopeless. And I, and I want to say to the doctors out there who think they understand what's going on, I want to say you do not understand what's going on. You do not understand how much you're being played with. And you must, if you want to fulfill your professional goals and ideals. How would you spend $10 billion dollars to make the world a better place? Well, um, my lens is healthcare. I mean, this is what I live and breathe and have done uh, uh, seven days a week for many years decades. Um, so what I would do to spend this $10 billion dollars would be to set up a health technology organization in the United States that could be an example for how it could be done in other countries. And when drug companies refuse to submit their data, I would use some of that money to fund the megaphone that would tell the public that the Drug companies aren't willing to be honest brokers in this information. For example, I think the COVID uh, vaccines, the initial COVID vaccines, I think they saved millions of lives. I think that drug companies, Moderna and Pfizer and BioNTech, I think they skimmed billions and billions of dollars off of this. And it was sinful how much money they made. But I think those vaccines were effective in the beginning. But the three boosters that we've had now since the initial vaccination, they do not have evidence from randomized controlled trials to support any, any of those boosters. The first one was an observational study from Israel that was not valid. The second one, the second booster was supported by data. Pfizer's booster was supported by data from eight mice, eight mice. And Moderna did better. They had 10 mice. <laughs> and that's the data that supported the second booster. And the third booster, uh, 
one of the companies had one randomized control trial that gave showed that the the latest booster uh, increased antibodies to COVID in 50 people for two weeks. At two weeks, that's it. That's it. And I would and and that people don't know that, and that doctors think they understand who should get a booster and who shouldn't. It's nonsense. So I would use that ten billion dollars in part to spread this word, to show how people are trusting their doctors and the doctors are trusting their journals and the CDC in the United States to to um, push these boosters when we don't know whether they work or not. I'm a little bit older. I got a booster. There's no information. I don't have good information or bad information. And if they are going to increase my antibodies, I'm in an age group that's at serious risk if I get COVID. Uh, that's at serious risk if I get COVID. So I get the booster because I don't know about harm, but I don't know if it's worth anything. But I would use the $10 billion to explain to people just how much they're getting played with and the FDA is letting them get played with and the doctors don't understand how they're getting played with, to let them know that maybe they would get angry enough to start listening to how serious this story is. So if, 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 you're, if you've got $10 billion, I, I know how to use it. <laughs> um, well, thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to know more about uh, John Abramson and his insight, um, check out his book, like he already, like he already said, uh, Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare and How We Can Repair It. Thank you very much for taking the time. Timon, thank you so much for uh, helping me to get this information out. It is so important. And without journalists who are willing to take this on, we're never going to make any progress. <laughs>